Hello, everybody. We're very pleased to welcome, uh, actually for the first time to Sarah Week, uh, Vice President Bharat Chardeo, uh, Vice President of Guyana. And uh, we're, it's great that you're here. Thank you for joining you. us. And obviously a lot of interest in, uh, in what's happening in Guyana. As you pointed out to me before we uh, sat down, in 2019, uh, Guyana was producing this much oil, zero. It's now producing 350,000 barrels a day. And uh, the track uh, by 2030, which is seven years away, to be 1.2 million. So, 2027. Oh, by 2027. Yeah. That's even quicker. 2027. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, well, at least my understanding, this is the fastest offshore oil development in history. How did it happen? Well, I think, I think the find is a great find. And therefore, um, the, the investors see the interest there. And they want to develop these resources at an accelerated pace. And they, we in Guyana, from the government side, we support that vision. The fast-paced development of the, the resources offshore, particularly in the context of net zero, we believe it's a wise strategy to do as much exploration as possible now, prove the resources, and then have them um, removed and transfer into financial assets that in the future can serve to transform the country. And we badly need transformation in that. Right. So um, until the initial discovery, I mean, Guyana was not particularly high on the list of countries to explore in. Yes, um, that, that's true. Um, but not just, we, we had a history where we sought to explore in the earlier period and then we had some issues with Suriname. Oh. They sent a gunboat and we had to stop the exploration with CGX. And then at that time I was president, we went to the the international court and got the maritime boundary settled with Suriname. Right. So that Exxon Mobil there at that time had declared a force majeure and then they resume exploration after after the border was settled. Right. And uh, what's been the philosophy from the side of the government to encourage, you know, speedy development? Responsible but speedy development. Well well it's the pace at which we license the the um, new developments, I think they are rapid without, of course, um, compromising on due diligence. We don't have much of that technical capability at home. It's a, it's a, new, country, a, a new sector to the country and we have to buy that capability. Right. And so we've been doing that to, to keep pace with the development that the oil sector has, has, has proposed. Um, so, so that is what has happened. We, we've just been providing a supportive regulatory environment. And I think because of that, we can move rapidly to, right. towards exploration. So um, in term, obviously you've been a political leader for many years in the country. Are people surprised to have this kind of development this fast? Um, at home, maybe not, more so abroad. Um, the industry had some negatives at home because of, of what is taking place global, globally. Um, this push to net zero, we have a lot of NGOs that have descended on the country. And some saying, don't leave the oil in the ground. In fact, we have uh, one NGO that has filed a case to stop oil production in Guyana, claiming that we are causing global warming. Now, what court have they gone to? The, the local court. It has no chance of succeeding because it's, it's flawed. With, with 10 FPSOs operating offshore, we will be carbon negative. We're already carbon negative. Where the world is hoping to get to in 2050, we're, we're already there. Our forest is bigger than England and Scotland combined. It is, um, so, so it's a huge sink. And therefore, we have a, a balanced strategy to develop the oil and gas industry, but we also have strong environmental credentials. And, and we're definitely not causing global warming. Right. Exxon's production 
in Guyana would be a, a tiny part of global emission. Right. So, well, I was going to come to it later, but since you brought it up, um, these NGOs and these people who criticize development, I mean, do they pay attention to the need for economic development in the country and what the per capita income is in Guyana compared to per capita income, say, in California? The, I think many of them are offshoots of international NGOs, and there is no balance in the global debate now. Um, if you look at the last COP, you had a conflict between those who were saying the oil and gas companies that are saying we need new technology, and those who are saying on the other extreme, stop producing oil and gas resources now. We must stop immediately. I believe that we're losing sight of the balance. We need to reduce the production of fossil fuel. We need technology, carbon capture, utilization, storage, and we need renewables. But the, the debate globally is not nuance. And it is this extreme that often doesn't care about the people there. They have an extreme leave all the resources in the ground. So we have people to feed. The people of Guyana, they have a legitimate aspiration to a better life too. Where our per capita GDP was about $9,000. Um, by the end of this decade, it would be $35,000. But still half of that of the United States of America. We're yeah. still not there yet. So, so we have argued that people have to have a balanced view. Many of these NGOs ne would never have that balanced view of development. What's your, I mean, what's your reaction when you hear those uh, attacks? It is, it is sad because it's, it's timing the global debate around climate change too. I've, we've been at this for a very, very long time. And it seems as though every, every time we meet at these bodies, say COP, the COP. It, we, we never make progress in a sustained way because people are not talking together yeah. to each other. It does certainly seem, and I think it became clear at the last COP, that there is a north-south divide on these questions. Yes. And I mean, you hear the same thing from countries in Asia and Africa. Yes. Um, because, um, so, so the countries that newly discovered oil, um, Suriname, some in Africa, Guyana. We're arguing if the United, um, United Nations Secretary General has said it's immoral to develop these resources. Um, the IEA said we must not right. develop any further resources. The US government at one time said that too. So we are arguing if, if they succeed in that happening, then effectively you're preserving a monopoly for the existing producers. Because even in a net zero scenario in 2050, you would still need large quantities of oil. Right. And so who should be the producers? If we, can't, if we can't enter the market now, then you're preserving a monopoly for the, yeah. for the current producers. Well, and that's one of the arguments we made. And that's why at the last COP you saw a lot of developing countries pushing back particularly those that have gas and, and yeah. crude resources. But of course, you have a depletion rate of 5 to 7% in world oil every year, mm -hmm. which it has to replace those barrels. Yes, yes. Right? Well, you've had, uh, obviously, great success so far. You have a new bid round coming up. Yes. And you want to just kind of describe that, because I think a lot of people here would be interested in yes. knowing about it. So, so this is the first time we're doing a bid round. And um, so we are learning too. We've recruited the consultants, IHS Market, to help us through this process. Um, we, at one stage, when we had a conversation about a year ago, we were thinking about a national oil company. Right. And then taking all the remaining offshore properties and investing them in a national oil company. We studied that and we decided that's not the best course of action. So we've decided to, to auction the properties. We've auctioned 14 
um, put on auction 14 properties offshore. 40 or 14? 14. 14. Right. And um, you can bid on any of them, uh, but the maximum that would be allocated would be three per, per, per successful bidder. Right. Um, the reason is that we want multiple no companies there in Guyana exploring right. at the same time, because we believe there is this window now that we need to, to get all the exploration done in. Um, we, we've just changed the fiscal terms with advice from IHS market. We're working on a model PSA and also a new legislation to update the one from 1986. It's 19. not 86. 86. So it is not fit for purpose yeah. today. And we want to ensure that even before we, the bid run is completed, that the potential bidders would see what the new PSA look like. So, but they would also have a chance because we hope to open consultations up shortly on the model PSA and also on the legislative changes for comments from, from the oil companies and others. And then finalize those so that they would see exactly what the environment will be. We want to make, emerge as a predictable uh, environment where our regulations dictate the highest industry standards, but they don't become a humbug to yeah. the development of the industry. And um, on the fiscal side, we want to uh, a lot of incentives remaining with people so that they can invest in Guyana, that we remain attractive, but at the same time, we want a greater take for the, for the country and the people of the country too. So that, those are the balances we are trying to, to achieve. But I want us to e emerge. We, I was saying yesterday to someone that our goal mining regime was changed once in the last maybe 30 years. And that was when the price of gold moved beyond $1,000. We said the royalty will go from, from 5 to 8% if it exceeds $1,000. But we never touched it for 30 years. So we believe in stability, we believe in predictability, we don't believe in a capricious government, we, but we have to have a world-class regulatory environment, um, both for, at the EPA and within the government. And we're working with the international groups, IHS market and others are advising us to put, put that in place because we have a paucity of, of um, the skills at right, all. So. We will build that capacity in future years, but it's not there now. And we can't await the development um, of the capacity to move the industry along. Right. Because the industry, the pace at which it's moving, is dragging us uh, from the regulatory side to, right. to keep pace with, with their changes. Right. So the 1.2 million barrels per day by 2027, is that based upon the existing, pro or is it based upon this next bidding round? No, 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 that's not based on, that's already licensed FPSOs. Right. Already licensed, that's clear. Right, right. So how does, as you say, uh, this is so, a tr the, No, the 700,000, the 1.2, we are now considering two new applications oh. from Exxon. Right. So once those are approved, we hope within a matter of months, those will take us to the 1.2. Yeah. Right. So uh, obviously this is going to bring a tremendous economic opportunity to Guyana. How does that, uh, are you, how are you using the money? Is it going to national development projects and to the yes. Sovereign yes. Wealth Fund? So, so we also had to ensure that we put in place a proper regime, a sovereign wealth fund. And what we did recently, in the end of 2021, we amended our earlier piece of legislation for, so that on the receipt side in Guyana, every cent of resources that we receive from the oil and gas sector has to be, the Minister of Finance has to notify the parliament and publish it in the official gazette. If he fails to do that within three months, there is a 10 years prison term. 
So that, the, get, that gets attention. Huh? That gets attention. Yes, that gets attention. So at the end of the year, every Guyanese can go to the official gazette and add down, and they would see how much we collected. Then we put in place a formula in the law so they can now apply the formula for transfer to the Treasury from the Sovereign Wealth Fund, and they can calculate, even before the budget is passed, how much will be transferred to the Treasury. And then we remove all direct charges on the, the, the Natural Resources Fund. So every expenditure has to be appropriated by the Parliament for the use of the resources. Right. And then we have a, some civil society oversight bodies that report to Parliament periodically on the management of the fund and, and the investment. So we wanted to have full transparency surrounding the use of the resources. We're, we're very careful about its utilization too because we want to avoid the Dutch disease. We're very, very conscious of that. So you'd see a massive capital program to build the infrastructure for the future wave of industries and growth. So hospitals, schools, power plants, um, the roads, port facilities, that's where the resources are being invested in, on education and healthcare, heavy, heavy um, investments in those areas. Right, and that's already started? That's already started, yeah. Um, are there designated national development projects big? Yes, there are some huge ones. Um, the gas, the energy project that we're working on, we just awarded a contract to a company, a U.S. company, that to build a power plant and the NGL facility that would, by 2024, start producing. We will, when that's completed, we'll cut electricity prices by 50% and have, and be an exporter of cooking gas, basically. Oh. So that is a game changer for people and for the private sector in Guyana because the stability of electricity, uh, so its supply and the price has been a deterrent to the development of other sorts of manufacturing. So that's a huge, that's going to have a huge impact uh, in, in Guyana. And, and then we're, we're building a hydropower and some solar. So at the, by 2030, we will triple install capacity of electricity and cut emissions by 70 percent. Right. So we are looking at our energy transition in Guyana to, to make sure that we are we're playing our part globally, not just through the forest, which as you know, we've just had a fir the only country in the world that has a jurisdictional scale certification of its forest. And that has presented a lot of opportunities for people. I, I must say Hess that bought 30 percent of our credits for $700 million, a minimum of $700 million, because if it's traded in secondary markets, we share some of the upside in the, right. in, in the prices. But Hess is doing more for forests now than many countries that, in the world. Right. And many of those who go to, to COP and lecture us on forests and the need to preserve forests. When the heads of government met in Glasgow, all they did was to sign an MOU that will cut deforestation or re remove deforestation by 2030. You have to have the right incentives. You have to co outcompete the alternate use for the forest. And that's the only way in the long run you'll be able to preserve forests, not by ph philanthropy or anything else, but by mar a market mechanism that gives incentives to these countries. And we have explored that. Some of our credit can be used in the voluntary market, but already it's the compliance market, Corsia, where is using, um, we are certified as credit for Corsia. So, so we are now moving up into the compliance market. We've been arguing for this for a very long time, for carbon price, for, for in real incentives to forests that would allow forests, which is, which contributes about the deforestation and land degradation, about 15, 16% of greenhouse gases. You'll never be able to achieve net zero without tackling forests as an abatement solution. Yet there is no world-class set of incentives to do that. 
Daughter paid Bateman solutions get a lot of attention, but not forest. Mm -hmm. So this allows us to move. We're working, we're sharing our experience with lots of countries. I was in India, I met with the Minister of Environment from Sri Lanka recently, and we're sending our technical people to share our experience with them. But, but this is something that is very important. So I just had to say that to here, and we still have 70% of the credit to sell. So if okay. anyone wants to, you can contact us. I mean, I, mean, I think <laughs> to many people hearing that your force is larger than England and Scotland gives a sense of the yes, scale of yes. it. Yes, but, yes. But you know, talking about indices and NGOs, I, Yale and Columbia did an environmental sustainability index. And the United Kingdom is number two on the index. And Guyana is 105. So just imagine, how could you produce any index in any, the, any matri matrix or a set of matrices that a country that has cut down all of its <laughs> primary forests will be number two in the world in terms of environmental sustainability. And we were 90% of our country is covered with forests. We're 105. But a lot of these indices are stacked against you, countries like ours, small yeah. countries, et cetera. It's, it's utter nonsense. Uh, there are some people here from Columbia University, if you want to. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I don't I know, know if they're in the room. prepared to take them on. No, uh, I'm, I'm prepared to look at, look at this. Yeah. yeah, we'll get you. I mean, like, like on the World Economic Forum to the Competitiveness Index, it has, you get marked down if you have malaria in your country. Well, which countries? Only the hot countries have malaria, malaria. but already you get a higher mark based on the size of your economy. So right. the United States would be number yeah, one right. every time. And there's very little, malaria, yeah. very little malaria in Finland. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. So how did this? Uh, how does your credit? Uh, how does the credit system work? Your carbon credit. System? So so we had two years of going through an international certification. They have something called trees. Now that's the environmental excellence standard, and it's it's done by the Architecture for Red Plus Transaction, which is an NGO. So we now, they came in, they did a lot of verification of the forest, went through it, and because of our track record, in, in 2009, I launched our low carbon development strategy. Oh. And we got Norway to buy $250 million worth of forest carbon. At that time, Prime Minister Stoltenberg right. was there. And because of that, we built a strong, a robust MRV system, monitoring, reporting, verification. So our forests have been tracked, and any change in the forest using satellite technology for the past 10 years. So we have a strong track record in this. So it was easy to, to transition from there into the, the certification by our the Architecture for Red Plus Transaction, Secretariat. Now we are listed on their registry. So the credits are available for sale right. because we are listed on their registry. So it's an external certification. We have met their standards and it's a rigorous standard. So for those who don't understand, so when Hess buys $700 million of credits, what exactly are they buying? If you want. Well, you should maybe, I think you're, you're interviewing Hess, so maybe you should get him to talk <laughs> a bit about what they're buying. I know what they're buying. They're buying the, the, the credit. We believe that this, this would be very valuable. Right. That the price that they paid now, which is higher than the voluntary market, fairly significantly higher than the voluntary market, for which we are grateful, will escalate in the future. It will escalate. The moment forest becomes part of the compliance market. Right. Um, other carbon is traded in the e EU ETS, you know, on nearly $100 per ton. Right. We are at $15 per ton, 15, 20, and $25 for three periods. Right. So we believe that it has, that those who are buying now the credit, that there is a great upside in the future to trading these credits right. subsequently. Right. 
And so uh, you're finding, I mean, general interest right now? I mean, yeah, we have a lot of people who, have, who are interested. We already have a lot of offers, right. but we want to make it more competitive. And now that Hess bought this large chunk, they have helped to de-risk the, some of it too. Right, right. right. So, and they've set a new benchmark on, on the prices. Right. Uh, going back to oil and gas, uh, oil, you talked about gas and electric generation. Is, is gas, is it mainly oil that's on the, re- the development yes. agenda, not gas? Well, Exxon, we are in a discussion with Exxon now. At the beginning, they said, we, we have 17 trillion cubic feet of associated gas. So a lot of associated gas. And they were cl- saying that they needed to re-inject this gas to keep the quality of the wells up. We're having a different concept. A conversation now um, to move to monetize these gas. So they're doing some studies, and we are we are also getting some external help to do a gas strategy. But we believe that's the next wave. Once we set this firmly on track, where it is already the production is escalating, we get out of the bedroom. We will start tackling that issue in earnest. You right. know, the the gas strategy because we believe that Ghana has huge potential becoming right. a gas producer. Right. So last question, I think it would be very interesting that ties into this in terms of the development of infrastructure, the physical infrastructure to the ports and everything to support this offshore development, and then with human infrastructure in terms of training. Like to- yeah, sure. So we, we believe that the industry, the companies that come to Ghana would do extremely well. And we believe we have to share this future and share the prosperity. But that would require the companies to work with us a bit more. And, and so when we, for example, we, we were going to pass the local content law, many of the companies were skeptical. They said this may shut down the bus- right. their business. And we did it. It's been in operation a year. And the companies are doing well, and a lot of business now, a lot of opportunities have come to the locals. And so that has changed the dynamics. There wasn't a a big excitement about the industry in the local population. But now, because they are becoming integrated in it, the goodwill for the industry has skyrocketed from early period when they thought, oh, These guys were operating in an enclavic way. They just get the oil offshore and take it away. Nothing comes on shore. So that's what we want to work with, with the oil majors on, to make sure that we share. And if that, that's going to be more sustainable in the long run. So a lot of those opportunities have come there. We're working with ExxonMobil and the others on a huge facility for training Guyanese. We, well, I was going to ask about that. Yes, we are training Guyanese. We, are, we start with recruiting the skills in to come and train and certify people. So as the local population gets more opportunities from the sector, we, we, I've seen this happen in other parts of the world. I go and it's an enclave yeah. they, with expats and the oil and gas industry. It doesn't become integrated into the industry. Right. We're determined to see that the benefits flow across the country. And it's a it's good long-term strategy for the in investors too. It doesn't require more money. It just requires a bit more time and doing things differently. Sometimes they're not accustomed to doing things like that, to be more, more you know, people-friendly and all of that, the more hard-nosed business, business types. I'm sure there are no hard-nosed business people <laughs> in this room here. <laughs> But, but it's a good long-term yeah. strategy yeah. because it brings enormous goodwill. Right. Well, I think it is um, what's happening in Guyana is very significant. What you and your colleagues in the government are doing is very significant to make this work. And this will have great impact. We're very pleased that you've come to share uh, here at Sierra Week. And I know you'll be here for a couple of days. And so certainly there'll be opportunities for people yes, to yes. meet with I'm you. Looking and forward discuss to that. It. So please join me in thanking Vice President. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you.